Let's do a little comparison. The Israelites in Egypt and the Israelites in the desert. Let's compare. The temperature in Egypt. Were there aircons? No. Cold nights? Yes. Versus the air, great aircon in the desert. You know, during the day, God had this huge cloud, moisturous cloud, to cool them, cool them down. And at night, when it's freezing cold in the desert, the huge aircon gave heat. So here's the first thing that uh, they could have been happy because, because of the aircon, God's aircon. Health? Man, they were sick in Egypt. Uh, what about sickness in Egypt versus sickness in the desert? Nobody got sick in the desert, except for, a sh for one month when they asked for a, a meat diet. And they got so sick, some of them died. But they had health from start to finish, even when they were rebels. No medical bills. Authority. Who was the authority in Egypt? The slave drivers, slave masters. No, no kindness, no mercy. They worked day and night, seven days a week. Their slave masters in Egypt with the Lord in the desert. I want to be with the Lord in the desert. <laughs> He's kind. You can never uh, exhaust his beautiful character. And then food. Uh, I mean, what did they eat in Egypt? They were slaves. They ate the bare necessity. And when you're hungry and worked hard, the, ta the food tastes good. Uh, and in, in the desert, what did they eat? One day in heaven we will taste the manna. But here was a composition of food with all the components in to cure diseases, the immune system. They ate that food designed by God himself, the great chef. And they, they complained. Clothing? In Egypt, they, they had to buy clothes, sandals. During the 40 years wandering in Egypt? No. Not one piece of garment deteriorated. I'd rather want to be in the desert than in Egypt. Homo viator, says the great French philosopher. There was no destiny while they were slaves. But once God took them into the desert, Homo viator, there was a destiny, the land of Canaan. And so I can go on and on and on. They forgot the blessings of God. And became bitter and complaining. Your choice, my choice. What caused them to make the wrong choice? And what caused us to make wrong choices? If you don't say thank you to God every day of your life, you may start complaining of blessings that you don't have. What happened to Israel during their long stay in the wilderness? Because of their rebellion. Judgment demanded that the sins of rebellion at Kadesh Barnea be punished. Lex talionis, tooth for a tooth. We're going to discover new dimensions in this lecture of God's fairness and love for his rebellious people. Can you believe it? He even loves rebels. May the study of God's colorful character paints our hearts with the colors of loving obedience and contentment. Study God and something will change inside of you. May we appreciate and love him just a little more after this lecture. I pray God, please, be with the audience and may, may they see your kindness anew. For nearly 40 years, the children of Israel 
are lost in view in the obscurity of the desert. Listen to what the word of God says. 38 years passed from the time we left Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the Zered Valley, that's in Jordan. By then the entire generation of fighting men had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. What a sad statement. It seems to me that sin and rebellion lead to death of more than a million people. Do not die with a rebellious heart and lose eternity. Deuteronomy. The Lord's hand was against them until he had completely eliminated them from the camp. Why are we so rebellious? What cure is there for my sinful rebellion? In the rebellion of Kadesh, they had rejected God. And God had for some time accepted their rejection. You know, this is how God works. It's a, it's a love relationship. He never forces people. Since they had proved unfaithful to his covenant, they were not to receive the sign of the covenant, the right of circumcision. The desire and choice to return to the land of slavery had shown them to be unworthy of freedom. How sad. At the ordinance of the Passover, this man is participating, as you can see, instituted to commemorate the, del del the deliverance from bondage was not to be observed for obvious reasons. They missed out on the beautiful ceremony of the Passover. They wanted to go back where they were before. How sad. The devil tells us that there are advantages in transgression. That's a lie. And we are so stupid, we believe him. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But the history of Israel reveals the opposite, the sad opposite. Would God reject them totally? Would he withhold his blessings from them? This is what the hardened rebels deserved. You know, when we are cross with somebody, we withhold our smiles and blessings. But God is different. He didn't do that to them. The tabernacle services continued as before. There was still time to repent and accept God's forgiveness. In his great providence and love, God still supplied their physical daily needs. Room service on the Sabbath, they didn't have to go out. The manna in the house didn't go bad. How do we treat our enemies, those who rejected our kindness and love? Hmm. In summing up the history of Israel on the border of the promised land, Moses wrote the following words. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He knows you're trudging through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. If we follow God, we will lack nothing in the wilderness of the sad life. It is safe to be obedient. Nehemiah vividly pictures God's care for Israel, even when during these years of rejection and banishment. Listen to this. Yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. What a God! Did not forsake them in the wilderness. They were enemies to God, but God wasn't an enemy to them. The pillar of cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. This is how we treated them for 38 years without receiving a thank you. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them 
and did not withhold your manna from their mouth. And you gave them water for thirst. You know, everywhere they camped, Moses spoke to the rock and there was a huge river. They drank, they washed their clothes and they swam in that river. The rebels, this is how he treated the rebels. How do I treat my rebels? Forty years you sustain them, says Nehemiah. In the wilderness, sustain them, cared for them. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. What an unbelievable way to treat people who rejected God and who wanted to kill his servant Moses. You know, the New Testament gives us insights into the profile, the character of God. But uh, the Old Testament equally give us a wonderful profile of a loving God. Can you believe it? The clothes they bought in Egypt did not perish. What a God. <laughs> Caring for those who rejected him. The wilderness wanderings was not only ordained as a judgment upon the rebels and the murmurers, but it was to serve as a discipline for the upcoming generation to prepare them for entrance into the promised land. What a kind God. He changed the disastrous trauma into something positive. It's worth following him. I like the way Moses explains it. Deuteronomy 8 verse 5. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord God chastens you. You know, when God disciplines us, it is because he wants to teach us a lesson. A lesson that we will not otherwise learn. You learn through your tears and disappointments. And God uses these. He allows this to bring you closer to him. Why do we discipline our children? I hope you do. It's biblical. You've got to do it. Otherwise you spoil them. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son. Listen to God speaking. My son. In lovely tones. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by, his, rebuked by him. Maybe you suffer consequences. God wants you to see this in a positive light. He loves you. That's why he allows discipline. From whom the Lord loves, he chastens. <laughs> and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as, as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? If we could see the difficulties of life in this light, it would become easy to go through these traumatic experiences. But if you are without chastening, I never feel it's chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. If God disciplines you, he still has hope for you to be saved. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. So many people become bitter when life changes its face. Don't become bitter. Pray to God. And say, God, do what you want to do with me, but save me at last. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful. Of course not. <laughs> For the present. But painful, nevertheless, 
Nevertheless, afterward, it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Regard it as joy, says James. Have you tasted the afterward as a child? <laughs> it is sweet and very satisfying. My mother used to, to give me a hiding, but then she embraced me. And this is what God does for us. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you. You know, we don't want to be humbled, but we need it. To humble you and test you. To know what was in your heart, whether, you're, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Hmm. I'm so glad God disciplined them all the way till they reach the promised land. I'm so glad he will discipline us all the way to our heavenly promised land. We need his discipline desperately. Appreciating God's colorful goodness and discipline, we become humble and contented. Forgetting his kindness, we become miserable and start murmuring. You have to thank God every day for at least five blessings to prevent you to become a bitter person, a rebel. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. It is by forgetting what God has done for us in the past that we take the first step, step to the land of death. You have to praise him daily, sometimes hourly, for small mercies. Say so just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Let the word of God feed you daily. Where else do we find this expression? Every word, Jesus used it. He found him in a desert land and in a wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of the eye. Why mentioning his care for us to the apple of the eye? How do we thank him? How do we thank him for his love and his care for us? How do we do it? Say thank you more often. Appreciate him more often. Not once in all their wanderings do we hear the people say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the manna. Thank you for the water. Thank you for the cloud. Thank you for the fire by night. Thank you for the tabernacle. Let's improve on the frequency of the word. Thank you. All they did was murmuring and complaining. Fortunately, we are just the same. <laughs> because of Korah's initial rebellion, more than 14,000 14, people died. There were isolated cases during this time that showed the same spirit of contempt for the divine authority. Listen to this story. Now the son of an Israelite woman, whose father was an Egyptian, what a combination, went out among the children of Israel, and this Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought each other in the camp. Can you see the fight? Now divine law forbade him, the Egyptians were being excluded from the congregation until the third generation, and God had reasons for this. A dispute arose between him and an Israelite. The matter was then referred to the judges who declared him guilty. Enraged at this decision, we don't want to be reprimanded. 
he cursed the judge in Egyptian or Hebrew, I don't know. And in the heat of passion, blasphemed the name of God. I wonder what he said. He was immediately brought before Moses. The command had been given. And he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. But no provision had been made as how to handle this terrible case. God himself pronounced the sentence. The blasphemer was conducted outside the camp and stoned to death. It doesn't pay to be rebellious. The man was locked up until the will of the Lord could be established. Sitting in that jail, there was time to repent, but he did not. Those who had been witness to the sin placed their hands upon his head, thus solemnly testifying to the truth of the charge against him. Then they were the first to throw stones Tones at him. The people who stood by afterwards joined in executing the sentence. God did not extend the suffering. He was killed within minutes. God does not delight in punishing people for a long time. Then you shall speak to the children of Israel saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. Discipline, I like God's discipline. The stranger as well as him who is born in the land, when he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. Now some people question God's love and his justice in punishing, a punishing word spoken in the heat of passion. People like to criticize God. In my research in biblical studies, yeah, people blame God, these scholars, for being unfair. He's not unfair. He's a fair God. Lex Talionis, the punishment matches the crime. And this is the character of God. He will only punish you for your crime. And in the punishment, he's asking you to repent. What a God. But both love and justice require it to be shown that utterances prompted by malice against God are a great sin. Lex talionis. Punishment matches the crime. The retribution visited upon the first offender would be a warning to others that God's name is to be held in honor. And this worked. It works today as well. Where people are not punished. They just carry on. And some governments allow people not to be punished. And you've got disaster, distress in those countries. What would have happened if this man's sin had been permitted to pass unpunished? Others would have been demoralized. And as a result, many lives must eventually have been sacrificed. The mixed multitude that came up to the Israelites from Egypt were a source of continual temptation and trouble. They profess to have renounced idolatry and to worship the true God. But their early education and training had molded their habits and character. This is at a place called uh, Beni Asan in Egypt. They were corrupted with idolatry and with irreverence for God. They were often the ones to stir up strife and were the first to complain. First to complain. The guide wants to show us something inside. I think he needs a bakshi. <laughs> In Egypt, they need bakshis. Shall we follow me inside? Yes, let's go. What do you see here? Fighting Egyptians, wrestling Egyptians, wrestling and boxing were their sports. They grew up in a, in, in a, in a syndrome of fighting boxing and wrestling. And they continued with this syndrome throughout the 40 years. Cause of their problem. This is the cause of their problem. They leavened the camp with their idolatrous practices and their murmurings against God and their fighting and wrestling. 
Soon after the return into the wilderness, an instance of Sabbath violation occurred. Maybe you've read about this. Under circumstances that render it a case of peculiar guilt. The Lord's announcement that he would disinherit Israel had roused a spirit of rebellion, as we've seen. A one of the people, angry at being excluded from Canaan, was determined to show his defiance of God's law. How did he demonstrate his anger at God? He ventured upon the open transgression of the fourth commandment by going out to gather sticks upon the Sabbath. Can you see him? Can you see his body language? During the sojourn in the wilderness, the kindling of fires upon the seventh day had been strictly prohibited. Why? There's a reason why God allows certain things. The prohibition was not applied in Canaan. Why? I see winters would often render fires necessary. I was there in uh, Jerusalem once in the month of, of February. And this is what it looked like. I can testify to snow in, in Israel. And God would allow them to make a fire. God is a just God. In the wilderness, fire was not needed to keep them warm. The pillar of fire was sufficient. The act of this man was a willful and deliberate violation of the fourth commandment, a sin not of thoughtlessness or ignorance, but presumption. He was challenging God. He was taken in the act and brought before Moses. Can you see it? It had already been declared that Sabbath breaking should be punished with death, but it had not yet been revealed how the penalty was to be inflicted. The case was brought to Moses before the Lord and the direction was given. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. Sins of blasphemy and willful Sabbath breaking received the same punishment being equally an expression of contempt for the authority of God. He was challenging God, this young man. Don't challenge God. In our day, there are many who reject this creation Sabbath as a Jewish institution. Don't bother about it. Why? Why do they say it? They say that if it is to be kept, the penalty of death must be inflicted for his violation. But blasphemy received the same punishment as the Sabbath breaking. Should the third commandment, blasphemy, also be a test to set aside, applicable only to the Jews, yet the argument drawn from the death penalty applies to the third, the fifth, and indeed to nearly all the ten precepts, equally the fourth. Though God may not now punish the transgression, now listen to this, my friend, though God may not now punish the transgression of his law with temporal penalties, yet his word declares that the wages of sin is death. In the final execution of the judgment, it will be found that death is the portion of all those who violate his secret precepts, his law. Are you disobeying God? There's no future in disobedience. During the entire 40 years in the wilderness, the people were every week reminded of the sacred obligation of the Sabbath by the miracle of the manna. On a Friday they had to collect twice as much so that on the Sabbath they had room service. What a God! Yet even this did not lead them to obedience. Ah! (laughs) Can you believe that God put up with their rebellion all these years? And with mine as well? God declares through his prophet, 
my Sabbath, they greatly polluted. And this is one of the reasons for the exclusion of the first generation from the promised land. Yet their children did not learn the lesson. Sabbath observance was neglected. And though God allowed them into Canaan, he declared that they should be scattered among the heathen after the settlement in the land of promise. Here at Kadesh, the children of Israel had turned back into the wilderness. What happened at the end of the desert journey? Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. It seems that this was a different Kadesh to the first one, because it was situated on the borders of Edom, and I'll come to this. Can archaeology tell us where Miriam was buried? This would help us to understand the two Kadeshes. According to Josephus, Flavius Josephus, Miriam died near Petra and was also buried there. The monastery at Petra was later built over the tomb of Miriam. The modern name Kadesh, according to some scholars, is called Albeda. From the scene of rejoicing on the shores of the Red Sea, when Israel went forth with song and dance to celebrate God's triumph, to the wilderness grave, which ended Miriam's lifelong wandering. What a sad funeral. Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Such had been the fate of millions who with high hopes left Egypt for the promised land. And if you and I move out with high hopes to enter the promised land, we should not be rebellious. It can keep us out. Loretta says, Sin had dashed from their lips the cup of blessing. Sin had dashed from their lips the cup of blessing. Would the next generation learn from the mistakes of the fathers? But even after all that, they kept on sinning. Even after they had seen the miracles he did, they still didn't believe. So he brought their days to an end, like a puff of smoke. He ended their years with terror. Whenever God slew them, they would seek him. This is from the Psalms. They eagerly turned to him again. They remembered that God was their rock, that God most high was their redeemer. Were these genuine conversions? Let's listen to the rest of the psalm. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth and they lied to him with their tongue for their heart was not steadfast with him nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. I like this. Say something to me. He remembered that they were but flesh. I thank God for this remembrance. We're just flesh. A breath that passes away and does not come again. In 20 or 50 years' time, we'll all be gone. A breath. And God looks at us and he cries. He remembers that we are flesh. Wicked flesh. Loretta says, we are the new Israel in a desert of trials, on our way to the promised land. 
But trials when seen as educators will produce joy. I want to repeat this. Trials, and there are so many, when seen as educators will produce joy. Lord, what can I learn about this lady that slanders me? What can I learn from the man who stole my car? Maybe we should have another look at the trials of life. A positive look. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yet again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Bitterness, rebellion. They did not remember his power. The day when he redeemed them from the enemy. When they came out of Egypt, the sea opened and they crossed. May God help us not to forget the way he had led us in the past. If we neglect to praise him for his goodness, we become rebellious and disobedient. And I want to repeat this. May God help us not to forget the way he led us in the past. His blessings. Maybe you should have a diary. Write it down. Let us thank him daily. Looking, th looking at the palace where Miriam was buried, the place they call it the monastery, a, a thought came to me. Let us enjoy the heavenly blessings of contentment. Heavenly blessings of contentment. And avoid the bitter curses of discontentment. May God help us to love him and obey his precious commandments, not to impress him by our obedience, but because we appreciate him. I invite you to come and listen to the last time that Israel ran out of water and what happened to them. May I invite you to love and trust God with all your heart. Father in heaven, thank you remembering that we are flesh, a puff, a moment. But help us in our short lives to see you as a loving God, a God who wants to save us. There's an enemy that tells us to be rebellious Help us to shun the devil's thoughts and listen to the music of your love. In Jesus' name, Amen.